Well, thanks everyone. Good morning. Um, um, glad you guys come and make it <laughs> after that fun times yesterday. Um, so uh, this this talk is interesting for me because I usually don't give developer oriented talks, cause, but uh, so um, for once I, I get to I get to do something more technically focused as opposed to uh, uh, more of my community talks. Anyway, um, again, thanks for coming. This is uh, this is about GitLab a year in review and uh, uh, what should come next. This is mostly like to talk about what we've done in GitLab so far. Um, but more, I, I wanted to do kind of a, a brainstorming session about what can what can we do better, like in the next iteration, right? So. All right, is that better? Okay, all right. Sorry. Um, so so let's, let's start with a little history. Um, when we when we started GNOME, it started off with CVS. <laughs> so um, I don't know if anybody knows that that was that was uh, an interesting interesting uh, way to start. Um, it is really ancient technology, and um, sometimes when I look back and see how how we even managed to do software engineering with such tools is, is beyond me, but <laughs> but so it is. Then then after after that, um, it was uh, decentralized uh, version control systems, right? So that's your bazaar, um, Git, and uh, a, a very lesser known VCS called Arch. Um, that was um, I don't know if anybody remembered Arch, but <laughs> uh, interesting f developer. Lived most of, lived uh, lived out of his car for most of, most of the time that thing was developed. Yeah, yeah, it, it was it was it was interesting times. Um, and so we had uh, a Git versus um, BZR at one point, uh, and then eventually uh, Gnome moved to Git, and then which uh, that was interesting because I think it was like. 15 years of code that had to be moved from CVS, again, exclamation point, to, <laughs> to get. <laughs> so, uh, but then life was a lot better after, after that happened. Um, um, you know, Git made a lot of things easy for us. And so that was, that was good. Um, so we were able to do like easy branching, things like that, uh, and a lot of our release methodology came from that. Uh, um, so the next, it's kind of hard to see my slides here. I'm, I've gone, I've gone uh, far-sighted in my old age, and so I can't, when, when the screen is like this close, you're like. <laughs> so um, uh, again, also better permissions, um, I, I lost my, I actually lost my lost my Git privileges for the longest time. I had CVS, and I, I got I got uh, I had I had access to commit anything I want, but now I, now it's gone. <laughs> um, and um, uh, contribution module that easy for patches, things like that. So so that was great. But the world moved on, and um, we. Um, we um, we've been slow to move with it, and so when we moved to GitLab, and it's been about two years since we did that, um, we we actually modernized. I mean, that was the start of our modernization of of software engineering. Um, a lot of that time was spent uh, in, in the old model. Um, a lot of a lot of, lot of overhead, and uh, with with GitLab, uh, we we really were able to do things. But with the CI pipeline, we were to get better better uh, stability, things like that. Uh, so there was a lot of lot of great things that happened. Uh, there were some other, other things like community participation, right? So if you think like now our like our uh, 
uh, merge requests are now all posted on social media, which is sometimes good and sometimes bad <laughs> because uh, a lot of times uh, little known little known uh, merge requests turn into blow up because people misunderstand what the merge requests do. Uh, there's large flame wars that, are, that shows up in the merge requests. Uh, you know, it's it, 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 there's definitely people feel uh, there's also things that are experimental that gets posted. So there's all there's all kinds of funny stuff that happens. But you know, all of those contribute to greater visibility of how we do that work. So in our old model, uh, I think uh, a lot of how we did GNOME was sort of opaque, uh, and g I think having this kind of enthusiasm. Uh, is, is definitely something that um, uh, even though there's negative negative issues with that is actually overall good. Um, I think for GNOME to be successful, we still have to be even more open about how we how we do our source code and and so forth. So uh, so yeah, so that's basically uh, I think some of the good stuff that's happened. Um, I think moving to GitLab has also given us more efficient workflows, um, better testing, thanks to CI. Um, I think there's also the ability of, I think, and this is what I want to do with a talk, is about more complex workflows. And I, I came up with a couple things that uh, I like to talk about, which I think would be interesting in terms of models um, and, and so forth. So uh, recently, Carlos put in some of the things that might be coming up in uh, GitLab. Uh, we have Azure licenses. So if you're, if you're thinking about um, uh, better support for Windows, that means um, we're, especially for um, GTK, right? Um, we're, we're able to do better building of software on Windows. I think that's something. That's going to be very interesting. Um, the merge request for confidential issues. So uh, KDE recently, you're like, if you have security bugs, sometimes you don't want them revealed. This is a good way to get one and then have them um, confidential until you're ready, to, until it fixes in, right? It's that kind of thing. Um, and then. Um, there are sometimes social, especially we we're I guess uh, our community is very sensitive about features being removed. <laughs> so sometimes if you're doing uh, a merge request, that might be socially uh, not. We could, we could do that more in a hidden fashion. Um, and then this other one at the bottom is really is something interesting. It's multi-project pipeline. For CI, that's there's um, what that is is being able to kick off uh, CI pipelines for um, different projects. So you you doing a merge request in one, it could kick out a CI pipeline for related projects. So uh, this is something that came out of Debian. If Debian, um, so it was a paid request, a paid feature. In, in the uh, enterprise edition, and then it moved to uh, the uh, public one. So, uh, and so there was an idea I had for this that wasn't available because it was a private feature that um, I'm hoping to uh, get that, uh, get this idea going for, um, um, for what I want to do, so. So, Speaking of ideas, this is um, so one of the things um, I've been really interested in, in terms of problems is extensions, and um, our extension stories have been a little trying for us. It's always been in the public, uh, something that shows up constantly, and and I think a lot a lot of times um, it's a misunderstanding about what. What extensions really mean? Like, you know, they're not part of GNOME, but everybody thinks they're part of GNOME, and then, 
And so um, that's one issue for that. But the other thing um, I think is we can actually improve that story uh, a lot easier. So the idea I'm thinking about in terms of extensions is actually moving all our extensions, all the extensions on the extensions.gnome.org website to GitLab and then being able to, so every time we do like a commit to GNOME shell, uh, we should be able to test all those extensions. And that's where that multi-project thing that was coming in. Uh, so if you can test all of that, then um, you could know how many extensions are broken by this commit, you know, by this merge request, you know? So there's, there's all these ideas of, okay, so we know this breaks this many extensions, or, and then we have the ability to um, contact these people and say, hey, listen, it's, it's broken, you need to fix it or do something. And I think it's a better quality control. Um, I, don't, I don't think as a project we, we, we take any, any initiative uh, speaking with developers. And going forward, I, you know, a lot of this, I want to be able to have more partnerships with our, uh, the people who use our code. So um, this is a, an overall idea. The other thing is um, code, knowing the code paths. If you know what people are using, you kind of know, like if you do a commit and you know it breaks these extensions, then at least you'll be able to say, okay, people are using this part of the API somehow or things like that. So, um, so I, I think this is something that that uh, is worth doing. And in fact, I have a couple people who are interested in implementing this. Um, and so hopefully we'll have something in a year. But I think, I think um, that's, that's some, this is some uh, ways to kind of improve our story um, because it, it, it takes a lot of time to review and put these extensions and publish them, so. Um, uh, for, I had ideas on release methodologies. Um, I think one of the things that I still am puzzled that we do uh, at least from releasing, is at least tarballs. Um, I don't understand why we do that now. <laughs> it's like, um, so one of the ideas I wanted to do is, you know, you can do releases into milestones. And, um, and one of the new, one of the things is if you organize them in milestones, you can keep all the bugs and features associated with that milestone. So instead of releasing a tarball, you put them under manage them all under milestones, and then you could automatically create tarballs or things like that, but this method is, is I don't understand it at all, and I, I don't know, I don't, I think it's something we're just doing for this, because we were always doing it, and so um, I'm not, I think that's something we should, we should get out of. Uh, the other cool things is be able to create, um, when you organize it that way, you're able to create great statistics and things like that. Um, again, it's about partnership out to the community, being able to do stats and publish them on social media, infographics, these certain things are, are something we can do. So, you know, we, putting out little things about what our releases do uh, is sort of an interesting thing. Um, uh, the, other, the other thing is being able to kick off images from from, from these releases. So with the engagement team and all the others, we, we find that having images very bootable is good for us, right? So we have our upcoming release coming up and we have many things dependent on it. We have release notes depending on it. We have video that's coming up and all of that requires knowing what the features are and able to play with them and so that you can publish them. So not being able to have them until late uh, makes, makes, makes it hard for the engagement team to, to talk up about the release. So you know, this is something that you should be able to generate as well um, and make that easier. Um, so, so far. Um, finally, I think as a, as a rule, um, driving more unit tests within all the projects is, 
is uh, another thing that that what we can we can do more in in GitLab is to be able to do all that. So, and and that of course will drive better higher quality. Ouch. <laughs> so um, that's pretty much my set of ideas. And really, what I wanted to get out of here was what would what would what can we do from all of you as a community uh, to make uh, to use GitLab better. Uh, something like that. So, um, but yeah, I'd love to hear it. What uh, what would be what would be an interesting project? I gave a couple ideas just to start it out. Is, um, all right, Philip, go. <laughs> oh, awesome! Uh, I really like the idea of, of GitLab bots. Um, about a year ago, I attended a workshop uh, um, from a Python developer. Mm -hmm. um, who had about building GitHub bots, and GitLab has a very similar uh, facility for building bots. And so, uh, from what I know from this workshop, the Python community makes um, great use of, of bots for like uh, categorizing merge requests and suggesting reviewers and backporting things to stable branches. And it, it sounded really awesome. And uh, I think we could do that too. Yeah, that sounds that's like uh, that sounds good. You know how hard it would be to implement something like that. Well, I, I managed to write a GitHub bot in this workshop in uh, in two hours after having never oh, okay. done it before. Right so, and then we can integrate that with IRC and many other kind of thing too. Which I think we do. We do have kind of a bot, right? That does with GitLab, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, any other? Yeah. Uh, one more time. I don't. I don't know. Um, yeah. The the other yeah the other test was the the test I was thinking of is loading and unloading was a simple test that I was thinking of. You run it in a Docker image or something, and then. Um, and then over time, you could you can create more fancy ones. But and this idea is not new. I, I, I came. We this idea started four years ago actually because uh, I started a QA team, <laughs> which didn't work out for me. But a lot but a lot of ideas came from that about how to test extensions. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, yes, there should be some testing of sector. Yeah. So one of the reasons why uh, we are still doing tarballs uh, is mostly, well, one, Stockholm syndrome, but apart from that, um, a lot of our downstreams rely on tarballs for whatever reasons, like distributions and whatever right. else. So I totally agree we should get rid of tarballs because yeah. Um, and the main reason why we haven't switched to making the CI pipeline generate tarballs for us is that it's currently complicated to get a tarball built on a CI, GitLab CI runner, um, like published on our own infrastructure, like moving it around. Yeah. Um, because the CI runners are not just owned by us, but also people can contribute like machines. Right. Like right. the GTK, FreeBSD, and Windows builders are currently like community contributed. Um, so we cannot just give them the keys to them infrastructure and move files around. Um, but it would be, I think, it, it should be one of the priorities for the sysadmin team and for infrastructure and uh, the GitLab administrators and stuff like that because it all 
also allows us to deal with the fact that since we switched to Mason to build our software, we basically cannot publish our API references anymore yeah. unless you build them locally and then you modify our library web uh, module, module configuration so that you can then upload a tarball of the documentation <laughs> and it's a mess. Um, so I think that should be like priority zero because right, right now people put sometimes like people realize after like six or eight months or nine months, hey, I've been doing releases of this library and there's no API reference anymore. <laughs> and yeah, that, that's kind of a problem. So I think that should be prioritized way higher than this now. Right, yeah, fine. Good, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, Federico. Uh, I have a question about releasing out of Git instead of tarballs and the comment about bots. Are distros ready to accept releasing from Git tags as opposed to tarballs? is responsible for obtaining that uh, a certain tag and then Structure in the sense that we are not signing enough things uh, because GPG is hard, <laughs> and it is. Uh, but yeah, I think we need to get over it and stop behaving like Git is uh, CVS from 1997 uh, and start like signing our stuff correctly. And uh, I have a comment about the bots. Uh, GitHub bots and GitLab bots are awesome. I'm very impressed by the Rust uh, community has a ton of bots. Mm -hmm. And one that is particularly interesting to developers is when they have bot called Bors. Uh, what it does is uh, somebody makes a merge request, bot automatically tries to build with that merge request merged and runs the test suite. If it passes, uh, a reviewer gets notified saying this merge request passes the test suite, so can you please review it? Mm. And then the reviewer can give a few commands to the bot, for example, uh, you know, merge it now merge it only when this comment gets resolved, things like that. Mm -hmm. And there's deadlines, like uh, if, uh, if a merge request does not get reviewed uh, by the deadline, uh, then it can either pick another reviewer or merge it automatically, or one, one can define a policy for that. So that, things, that makes things more fair for contributors, right, yeah. and it also keeps uh, maintainers kind of on the line because they cannot just ignore a merge request forever. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is uh, this kind of bot already exists for GitLab. It's called Marsh Bot, like Marsh, like the, the Simpsons. Yeah. It's not a merge bot; it's the Marsh Bot. And, oh, that's uh, cool. Uh, when we were running an older version of GitLab, there was like one or two missing features in order for Marshbot to really work. But I think now that's fixed. Uh, with uh, Jordan Fetridis, we've been experimenting using Marshbot. We, we tried it a while ago and ran into these missing features, but uh, now may be the time to, to do that again. And also one thing that uh, this kind of bot does 
laws is uh, it will refuse to merge something unless the test suite passes or the, or the CIE passes. That makes uh, people keep shit working.
last sort of comment on that? On Tuesday, the 27th, at 10 a.m., there is a themes workshop discovery session. So if you're interested in that kind of uh, problem that themes have, you should go to that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's not necessarily easy, but just like testing shell extensions, as soon as one person can figure out a way to do it, like for one shell extension, you, know, you can extend that to all shell extensions. And the same goes for testing themes. As soon as one person figures out a way to do it for one theme, then all the other themes can adopt it. That is very nice. <laughs> <laughs> so much packed in that city. <laughs> so it's a very simplified I'd like to live in this world um, where this kind of stuff is possible um, it, the, the main problem with testing even testing extensions is interesting but the basic the only test that we can actually guarantee is if I load up this extension, yep. does, the should, does the shell crash? Right. Which is a low bar that, in many cases, we don't pass already. But once we pass it, the next step is not linearly more complicated. It is exponentially more right. complicated. Yep. Um, does this extension work is not something that can be tested without having the knowledge of how this extension works. So the extension author should write something like an open QA like test. Right, right. Um, yeah, not gonna happen. Um, the other thing is people don't use just one extension. People may use a bunch of those for reasons. Um, and the interactions between extensions are a combinatorial like explosion potential issues. Right. Um, on top of that, and we go to themes, um, themes are, you can only run one theme at a time, luckily, um, but <laughs> applications have their own custom widgetry, which means their own custom like theme stuff, and then themes decided we should probably try to style those custom things so they ship with their own hash nautilus view or dot nautilus view or whatever and uh, nautilus path bar yeah great um, <laughs> another great widget um, so the the end result is that you don't just have to test a theme in a sense of here's the session let's load up the theme the custom CSS and then does it work? Who knows? What, what You have to launch a bunch of applications. Most of them are third-party applications. Now you have to install them, and now you have to like flat pack the entire thing if they have flat pack. Most of the time, they don't. So the end result is that you're basically doing distro QA. Uh, I would leave distro QA to distros because that's A, their job, B, they know how to do it, and C, it's their fault. <laughs> if stuff breaks. <laughs> I don't want to do distro QA. No, no, I, I think that's, that's
yeah, even with my idea with the extension, it is, it's, it's less, it's more about a communications tool than it is to being something like this huge QA thing, you know, thing, but it's, but I mean, the low bar of just doesn't work is, is, is actually great because every time you make a commit, then at least I know I have taken out 40 extensions <laughs> that maybe that's because they're not, Yeah, that that's always been. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. who's responsible for fixing the extension if you broke something inside GNOME Shell? The extension developers or the shell maintainer? Because again, shell maintainers don't scale. No, I, I, <laughs> I, well, yeah. So I, I would say it's always the extension writers. Right? I yeah. mean, so it's their yeah. software. But it, 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 oh no, of course, it, yeah. it's um, it's important to set that kind of expectation like upfront. Otherwise, it's going to be a mess. Yeah, if you want to ask a question, press the button in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Philip. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've found that it's it's difficult to reach, like, there's no one group of shell extension developers that you can talk to. Like, they're, it's, it's difficult to reach them. Some of them are, are very much part of, uh, you know, the community that, that a lot of GNOME contributors are. And other ones are just sort of off on their own, and they... Um, like their main place to communicate with each other is on Reddit, and which is kind of <laughs> alien to a lot of the uh, the GNOME community. Uh, and I, I found that, um, for example, making changes in GJS, uh, I tried to see like what's the best way to communicate that you know things might have to change in extensions. And the answer is that there there is there is no best way to reach the shell extension developers because there's no such thing as the shell extension developers. They're well, all in over this the case, the, the idea would be to only test the people that decided to move their extensions right. into the GNOME infrastructure. Yeah. So we that could reach they, them. Yeah. yeah, we would be if essentially centralizing extensions on one platform. Uh, and so presumably you'd be able, they would all be in one place rather than you know, GitLab.com or whatever, wherever they decide to put their extension, they they would be forced to, um, as a policy, to use you know, GitLab uh, for that, which I think is, is a is a good good plan to do because that's the only way it's going to show up on extension deck and that org. So, yes, Mo. <laughs> said, that's not everything works. Was there a red light on there? Whoa, that's loud. <laughs> um, uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about how teams are using GitLab to communicate with one another, especially around their development choices. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, anybody from the developer community want to answer that question? <laughs> Because the engagement team uses, I mean, like, we use GitLab, uh, but we don't, you know, we don't have as much communications with developers as much. I mean, there's more the other direction, right? There's more more of you in our engagement uh, thing, but how do how do all of you communicate with? That's a good question. Uh, I I work on Libras with you. And sometimes we get bugs, for example, sometimes we get bugs forwarded from GTK Fitspot because that's the API that people use to load SVGs as if they were any other kind of image format. So, uh, for example, sorry about that. Uh, no, it's fine. It's <laughs> so, GitLab lets you reassign forward an issue to another project that, that works fine. But I don't think it has a way to keep an issue. It doesn't have uh, bug dependencies like in Bugzilla. 
so you cannot say this box depends on this and this and this box. So part of me thinks that that would be a nice thing to have, but I also could appreciate the simplification in in, in body for two models, putting what we want, GitLab, you know. Uh, one very nice thing that GitLab does is whenever you reference an issue or a merge request from somewhere, uh, it writes a little note in the in the other case, in, in the other merge request, I mean, the other issue. So it's very easy to cross-reference things that people have been doing. So, uh, do you think like we don't create? We never created formal like at groups like you know like shell developers. I mean, did did we create things like that? Like engagement team. Let's say you wanted to bring the engagement team on a merge request or or whatever. Right, right. But we haven't set that up. Is is what I'm saying, right? Have we? It automatically works. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, yes. I know. I, I, uh, I am the champion at Numer. <laughs> but, but I, I think I, I don't think that, that's something we've used in general. Like. Right. Okay, that uh, does that answer your question, Molly? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I I think it's one of those things that evolves over time uh, as people try to get used to that, because that never happened. I mean, a lot of times we we're just following what we did in Bunzilla in some ways and have it used. That's part of this talk is about knowing what features are out there that we could take advantage of. Uh, w one, one other thing about communication. Uh, Christopher Davis is starting a project to have like a monthly newsletter kind of thing of what has happened in, in GNOME development during the month. Um, the way he's doing that is similar to the This Week in Rust, which is it's a project and each week people can submit pull requests Okay, we got one more minute. Last chance. All right. Hello. One question regarding 
the milestones on PS Starballs, will the milestone will follow the same approach with, let's say, scheduled uh, releases? So one milestone will be, will be in a year we'll have two milestones, or it will be something that will be decided uh, dynamically during the year. Um. Okay, go for it. Thanks everyone. It looks like we're out of time. Um, so thanks for coming, and I hope this uh, session was educational in some shape, way, or form. <laughs> uh, if you want to reach out to me, um, that's my Twitter, social media, email, whatever. All right. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>